All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Cameron Green, and I'm a master's student at the University of Victoria in South Africa. And, and I'm going to be presenting on my honours or fourth year research that we did. And yeah, I hope you can bear with me and I won't be too boring in this afternoon shift after lunch. So my project, or the project that we worked on, was evaluating student motivation and productivity during mapathons. So you can see here, this is clearly an um, open street map of uh, Bucharest. And you can see the intercontinental where we are, the theater, and the university. And you can see how dense and how much information there is and that it can be used to get around. I'm sure some of you here have been using maps.me or any other apps that have been using OpenStreetMap to get your way around here during this week. Um, and OpenStreetMap, obviously, we all know, was created for the purpose of open data. So quite a while ago, there was only government data and it was hard to get by. So a gentleman by the name of Steve Coast actually created the concept of OpenStreetMap. And um, now it has boomed into the project that we all know it is today. But there's different areas that look like different things. So we can see here d density information rich Bucharest versus this area called Lunsa in Sierra Leone, which is hardly mapped. You can see on the map, the OpenStreetMap and the aerial imagery, that it is a densely populated place, lots of buildings. And then on the map, there's nothing except for four little hospitals. And now imagine the Ebola outbreak that has been happening in West Africa over the last couple of years. Aid workers want to go out and um, spread some vaccines, but unfortunately there's no density information. So this is why OpenStreetMap is important. And how big is OSM actually to some people? That we try and tell this to our students. There's over currently 5.6 million registered users of OpenStreetMap. And how many people here actually have an OpenStreetMap account? One or two of you. And how many of you actually mapped yesterday? You see, no one does. But you can just point it out here that I ran this last night. So there was 5.6 million registered users, and only 5,933 of those users actually mapped something yesterday. So there is a small portion of people that actively map. And another thing that we like to impress the students with at the University of Pretoria is the size of OpenStreetMap. If you were to download the file, the whole planet file, unzipped or uncompressed, it is over 1,000 gigabytes of data. And then that's where you compress it down to smaller and smaller. But yeah. So now um, a mapathon or a map marathon is basically a collaborative effort by a group of people who meet together, so at a university or at a company, for collecting specific map data where OSM data is scarce or non existent. And it's typically done for humanitarian purposes, but can also be done for other purposes. And it is done through remote mapping. And you can see on the image below that we have some students from our university. Uh, they were sitting on Friday afternoon and they were just busy mapping the coastline of South Africa. Um, mapathons can also be social. We are not too strict on the students. We let them have a lot of autonomy when they do their mapping. So for example, you can see a student here is busy mapping the coastline and watching some cricket. Um, are there any Australians here? Okay, this was in South Africa, played Australia, and we won, just putting that out there. So, yeah. So, we all know mapathons are then held to assist with mapping efforts for various humanitarian projects. But, however, there's limited information available about the motivation of participants and what they perceive a mapathon to be. What is their understanding of a mapathon and what motivates them to contribute? So, we hosted four mapathons at the university to final year students. And we asked them to complete a short survey at the end of it to determine their uh, motivations and their personal opinions. We then used the results as we, uh, sorry, the results could then assist Mapathon organizers to create a more productive environment to produce data of a higher quality because of all that myth of OSM data, bad quality. We want to try and bust that. So this is just a quick little um, video of what we had, I think, roughly 10 students. They mapped for six hours. This is one town in South Africa, Mossel Bay. And you can see there was little, no data, and then all of a sudden roads come in, and then boom, buildings. This was one day's work by 10 students. They clearly did a lot of work, and they mapped buildings. And you can see, now this is in the OSM database forever now. So those four mapathons that we hosted, we did two in March, and then we did two in May last year. And we did either for two hours, 120 minutes, 
or one which was seven hours, and that was part of a larger project we worked on. So that was a two-day mapathon, but it only equated to seven hours of mapping. And the first two uh, mapathons were done in TeachOSM, so we could assign uh, projects, to, uh, what are the, projects to the students and cells so we can monitor who's mapping what and we can download the data. And then the next two we did in the Hot Task Manager, so the students can become familiarised with that in the, in the wakes of recent disasters. Um, we got them to map different things, so uh, the features mapped in, the, in, in Mapathon 1, 3 and 4 are relatively the same, easy ones, buildings, footpaths, roads. But then Mapathon 2, as I said, was part of a, another project, which was we wanted specific things to be mapped, such as boat launch sites, cul-de-sacs, car parks, roads and footpaths. And they also mapped different parts of the world, so the first two Mapathons were areas of South Africa, one was inland, uh, two towns, and then one was a coastal, and then two different areas in Bangladesh as well. So just a quick overview of the demographics of the people that were at our Mapathons. Um, so in Mapathon 1, we had 36 people, and then 19, 29, 31, and you can see the gender distribution is relatively spread throughout. Uh, I don't want to say it's too even, but you can see 53 to 47, and then 42, 58. So there's a relatively even distribution amongst our students. And they were all two third years except for Mapathon 2 where we had two second year students that came along. Um, and then the degrees, the three biggest degrees or undergraduate programs that they were studying were environmental science, geoinformatics, and geography, which is all core because all of them take a particular module that we advertise in the Mapathons to. And then we had some extras like BSEIT, geology, and meteorology, and so forth. So to understand what the students perceived a mapathon to be, we decided to ask them, what words would you use to describe a mapathon to someone who's never heard of one? So you go up to your friend who's studying engineering and you say, hey, do you know what a mapathon is? And they say, no, and you, how would you describe it? So we predefined some words for them, and we said, which ones would you use to describe it? And they could select as many as they decided, as they could wanted. So the three that were stood out, or the highest results that I actually want to bring to everyone's attention, is interesting. So for the students in their third year of university who have never actually attended a mapathon, found it very interesting, the concept, the idea, and they also realized the helpfulness or the usefulness of a mapathon in these areas. They understand there's no data, now they are creating data. And boring. So unfortunately with mapathons, it's pretty much the same process over and over again. You arrive, you get a bit of a welcome speech, you map, you leave. That's unfortunately the way it is. And that's why a small percentage of the students actually found it to be even boring, which is a bit sad. Then we gave the students some statements and we asked them to rank their agreement with on a scale of, of on a Likert scale of one being I strongly disagree, three neutral, and five strongly agree. So there's a lot of um, stats over there, but I want to draw your attention to three in particular. So it's the students consider the data they contributed during the Mapathon to be a value to be used for a base map. And they rated that 4.46 out of 5. So it shows they have a strong agreement to that statement. So they think they gave good data. And then we also said the social nature of the Mapathon. So we, for example, let them watch their sports, they listen to music, they also got to chat to people in their degree programs that they haven't necessarily seen. They got to interact with their lecturers on a, a less formal level, which also helps encourage them. And because there's a lot of people that have ne not necessarily contributed to OSM before, they found that using ID Editor was very easy and intuitive. It was a nice way to bridge, break, bridge the gap. I'm trying to think of the word, I can't remember it now. But um, bar entry to bar barrier to entry, sorry. So it's small, so it is able for them to use it. Then we thought, you know, maybe they're just being students and saying what, they, what I want them to say. So we decided to trick them with um, two different questions that ask the same thing, but in a different way. So we said I would participate in a mapathon in the future without any incentives. And we did offer incentives for this, these mapathons. We offered extra credits or free lunch or pizza or something to attract them. And a lot of them said, yes, I would contribute without any incentives. But then they said I would participate only if incentives. And they were very neutral on that. So I was expecting a complete opposite end of the results, but unfortunately I didn't get that. So then, to make the mapathons a lot easier and smoother for future people, or to understand how we can do it and attract more users, we decided to ask them what do they find difficult so we can see if we can help alleviate that in any way. So unfortunately, we hosted a lot of mapathons on a Friday afternoon, and everyone knows that's student time. 
So um, it was the only time we had free, and then we asked them some other things. So one trend I noticed was that the students' uh, biggest answer was that they had bad aerial imagery or cloud cover was their biggest problem, which then led to having problems with identifying uh, roads and footpaths, which also then led to problems in identifying the type of road surface. So these are our three biggest problems, and yeah, so they can be um, counteracted if you use your own imagery, but it's a mapathon and you don't really have money, so you're not going to have your own imagery. So at a university, apparently you're supposed to be there and you're supposed to learn stuff. So we decided to ask the students, what did they actually learn in this mapathon? Did, was there anything that stood out for you that you learned? So the biggest thing that they learned was mapping, the importance of mapping and digitizing. So they clearly learned the importance of digitizing and how to do it accurate. Um, they learned accuracy data. Uh, they can contribute and just open as well. It was something else we picked up that they learned. So we're quite happy with these results of what they learned. So then now to in terms of the assessment of the productivity. So um, Mapathon 1 and Mapathon 2 we were the only ones that we studied for this. And 36 participants versus 19 participants. And the time was also... Remember, it was, it was 120 minutes versus seven hours. So in Mapathon 1, um, the size of the area was, was dense. It was a smaller, dense area. And Mapathon 2 was quite a long coastline stretch of South Africa. So it was very long and, de and not so dense. So the features mapped were buildings and footpaths, which are very easy to see and, and not so hard to find. So they could map those, and there was lots of those. And then Mapathon 2, it was roads, a boat launch site, cul-de-sac, car park roads and footpaths. So that required a lot of searching and not necessarily a density feature rich area. So then in Mapathon 1, we had 8,242 nodes mapped in the 90 minutes. And that was a bit low, it was because the students, it was their first Mapathon that they ever did. They did the OSM tutorial, editing tutorial. When you first log in, it says, do you want to learn how to or start mapping? So a lot of our students did the learn how to map. So they did that first. And then the second Mapathon had significantly decreased to just under 20,000 nodes. So then, sounds like a lot, but then we try to break it down to some usable statistics. So the average nodes mapped per minute was 92 nodes, just under 92 nodes, and then just under 48 nodes. And yeah, so then we also then decided to go on the average nodes per participant. So in Mapathon 1, it was 305, and in Mapathon 2, it was 1,050. And one noticeable difference was the um, difference in that was because 36 participants versus the 19 participants. So the average will increase because there were less participants. And then we decided to make it how many, uh, the percentage of the overall, so how much one student presenter contributed overall in the whole percentage. So an average student in Mapathon 1 produced 3.7% of the data. And in Mapathon 2, the average student produced 5% of the data. And that also relates to how many people are actually at the Mapathon. So the more people, the less you contribute, in a way, and so forth. So just to conclude with what we actually learned and studied was that participants indicated that they would participate without any incentives. But our study and also related studies indicate that incentives are important. So a free lunch we gave to the students. There was extra credit for the students that attended Mapathons and completed it. And um, attendees also, uh, attendance in Mapathons can lead to the potential for future work or use of OSM. But this is not clear to some of our participants, as that they indicated that they would not necessarily use OpenSheetMap in the future, or they are unaware of how they can use it. So therefore, we thought presentations on humanitarian and general use of OSM before the Mapathon can assist with this. So once these four Mapathons were done and we had the results, we hosted another Mapathon. But this time, we decided to invite Doctors Without Borders or MSF to come talk to our students before the Mapathon. And the feedback we got from the students was that they really appreciated hearing from people who actually use the data. There was a GIS expert from uh, MSF that actually called in. And he spoke, and he gave the students, like, no, we use your data. And he gave them a scenario where it was um, they were trying to spread a, vaccine, a measles vaccine. And they didn't know how many people, but they used the buildings. And they said, OK, there's an average of five per, um, inhabitants per building. And then they worked it out that way. And they were able to spread a vaccine on, through Africa like that. So that's something the students were encouraged by. And they, they fired them up to present and give data on the next Mapathon. 
So then the social and the fun aspects should also continue to be encouraged, such as the mapping competition. So we, in the Mapathon that was part of another project, there was prize money to be won for those students who mapped the most, whose students had the best quality of data, and so forth. And then even playing some music, so we let a student play music, we brought a speaker, he could plug his phone in, and he played some music. And we also let them watch their sport, which was fine. And the barrier to entry, uh, the barrier to entry is low. Because a lot of the participants, like I mentioned earlier, do not necessarily understand Open Sheet Map, do not know how to edit all the time or digitize in QGIS like everyone else has done. So we used ID editors, it was easy to use, but it also lacks the advantages of validation that Jossum has. So it does become a bit of a double edged sword in this scenario. So I'd just also like to acknowledge, before I end, my two supervisors, Professor Kutzea and Dr. Rosenbach over there, as well as the South African Geoinformatics, uh, Geoinformatics Development Fund for funding my trip here. Thank you.